Today's episode is about to be a doozy. We're gonna go over some hot topics in the industry from the small circles as an instructor that I've overheard people talk, like students and other folks, to the stuff that you see on social media. It's just honestly laughable because it's just simply not true, or at least not completely true. Today, we're gonna bust some myths. The first myth that we're gonna to cover today is if a weld looks good visually, that means it is good. Visual inspection is probably the first line of defense when it comes to non-destructive testing. With a good set of eyes and a good set of tools, a weld inspector can pretty much determine visually if a weld is good or bad. Take this fillet weld for example. All we did for this fillet weld is put the two pieces of metal together and we made a MIG weld at the settings we would normally make. But we did one crucial thing wrong. To the naked eye, someone who's looking at this and doesn't really know what they're looking at, it might look like a decent weld or okay weld or better than I can make type of weld. But to the trained eye, we've got clear as day some simple lack of fusion and that's because there was one critical thing done wrong and the polarities were switched during the process. If you were there during the welding process, you would have heard that that sounded like absolute garbage. But if you're not trained or you didn't see the weld be made, you wouldn't really know unless we put it to some destructive testing. Pulling that to a break test, we could see that there is so much lack of fusion all throughout here. Just completely separated, so much lack of fusion, no penetration into the bottom base plate. That's why it's super important to not only get one-on-one -on -one experience when it comes to welding, but also understand the theory of things so you don't look like a dingus when you go to set something up or notice something's messed up in the first place. If you're looking to get further into non-destructive testing, Testing or maybe destructive testing and understand a lot more of the theory like I mentioned, go check out our partners at the American Welding Program. The next two myths that we're gonna talk about are kind of combined because there's still two completely dumb wives tales that don't work at all. I believed them at one point in time, but to this day I still see it and it's starting to, it's starting to cheese me off, man. Drinking milk does not protect you from toxic fumes and nor does putting potatoes on your eyes suck the pain away. I mean, just saying it just sounds Silly. I know there are gonna be some diehards down in the chat, but I would say that they have probably experienced what many call the placebo effect. The idea that I was told, literally this is what I was explained to me, is that the starch out of the potato as you slice it and you put it over your eyes will help kind of suck the arc burn. <laughs> it literally pull the arc burn out of your eyes. And if that was the case, you know, there's more starch in white rice than there is in grams of potatoes. So you might as well just treat your face like a wet phone and just stick your face in a box of rice. Wouldn't that work? just the same. I think it's more or less the case that it's just a cold vegetable that feels okay on your eyes. If it's that bad, you really need to go to the doctor, have someone drive you. Same thing with the drinking milk. The way it was explained to me was the calcium or the milk goes into your stomach and coats the lining of your stomach, helping you feel like if you're welding galvanized or something nasty that you wouldn't feel sick afterwards or during while you're welding the stuff. So you're breathing in something, drinking prevents. I don't, don't see how coating your stomach fixes your lungs. But when it comes to arc burn, you gotta wait it out or go to the doctor. And when it comes to getting really sick, wear a respirator or go to the doctor. Avoid it at all costs, right? That's why safety is so important. Which brings me to my next subject, which is the myth that welding is a dangerous job. Now the myth that welding is a dangerous job isn't exactly 100% true. I would say it's more of a hazardous job because if you look it up, there are a lot of hazards like, you know, getting sick from the fumes, getting burns from just the light on your skin and your eyes, not to mention the hot sparks and hot metal that could literally sear your skin. You may be subjected to other things like slips, trips, falls, dropped objects, confined spaces, heat exhaustion, the whole nine yards. Anything that you could put on a JSA, welding is probably considered a bit hazardous, but hazardous and dangerous are two different things. There are procedures in place, there are steps, there are rules, there's PPE, and if you follow those rules and if you wear the right PPE, you could pretty much mitigate any hazard that you would come across in this industry. It's not necessarily that welding is dangerous. What's dangerous is complacency. Nine times out of 10, it's someone that wasn't sticking to 100% of those rules or trying to cut corners or trying to move faster. That's why it's important that you follow rules and you watch other people around you follow the rules and at least give them the tap on the shoulder and be like, you should probably do that just for your own safety. Cause you never know, you might end up getting hurt or you might hurt someone else or even worse. For someone to say that the life expectancy of a welder is a lot shorter because of all these dangers, it's really just simply not the case. If you learn the rules, learn about the safety and how to prevent all of the hazards, you'll be good to go. 
Now I would say this next one is less of a myth and more of a misconception. And that is that you can weld just about anything with a multi-process welding machine. And while that's kind of true, what really is true is that you can weld anything with pretty much whatever process. You can TIG weld any metal, you could stick weld just about any metal, and you can MIG weld just about any metal with flux core. It just depends on the filler metal and base metal. You gotta learn about your P's and your F numbers, right? That's what really matters when it comes to making two pieces of metal stick together. You need to go and watch this video that we did a while back on selecting your first welding machine. That'll give you a better idea of what the machine is capable of. But what you really need to understand is how those two metals go together. Because once you figure those two things out as far as the base and the filler metal, then picking a machine is more about preference at this point. Sure, some machines are gonna work better at some tasks than others. Stick welding is obviously a lot more versatile as far as moving around where MIG welding, you might have a lot more production, but you could still weld aluminum, stainless, carbon steel with both of those processes. For example, these multi-process machines, all that I have right here and down here, none of them can TIG weld aluminum. This one is the only machine I got that does AC TIG. So that's kind of funny, even if it's a multi-process machine, it still doesn't necessarily have every function. But what I always say is if a machine is good at everything, it's probably great at nothing. This next one kind of came up in conversation the other day and it honestly is laughable when I heard it and that was that stick welding is outdated. And I would say, yeah, sure, anyone would say that it just can't stick weld really good. I get the train of thought. Stick welding was probably one of the first welding processes that was conceived back in like 1907, I think was when the first coated electrode was invented. And the fact that you have to switch out rods and, and whatnot it's kind of inconvenient, I guess. If you're sitting there MIG welding or the learning curve is a little easier because it's just point and shoot and you can do a little metal glue gun on some steel and you're good to go. But to say that it's outdated, what? There's so many reasons why you would wanna keep stick welding around. For example, the fact that you don't need any gas, okay? Don't need to carry around a bottle. Well, what about flux core? Yeah, you could have flux core. It's basically like if Meg and Stick had a love child, but now you might need a separate wire feeder and a different power source in order to run it. Stick welding is pretty primitive. I mean, again, it's been around just about the longest. You just need a power source, two leads, and a stick rod, and you're in business, man. There's so many places and, and needs for stick welding out there, and that's why it's still widely used in every little nook and cranny of the industry. Because like I said, you can pretty much pick any type of stick rod you want, and you can weld just about anything. Don't give up on the stick rod yet. I know there's a bit of a learning curve to it. You just need to watch a few more of my YouTube videos. Another old school train of thought is that in order to MIG weld, you need to have 75-25 mixed gas. That's 75% argon and 25% CO2. But we need to go back to the beginning of the video where it's like, okay, what P's and F's do we got, folks? And if you learn what P's and F's you got, you know that you can use these following gases. Y'all let me know if you guys can think of any more. We'll see you on the next weld.